Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. It's good to see all your smiley faces on this beautiful Sunday morning. Who's happy to see the sun? Yeah, I'm totally there with you. Please stand and let's worship.
may be seated. And what is your heart singing this morning? I trust that uh, you've come ready to worship uh, our Lord and Savior this morning. And good morning. It is great to have you here this morning. I want to welcome you, whether you're worshiping here with us online or whether you're here in person or later watching it on the Public Access Channel. It's great to have you worshiping with us this morning. And it's good to see you here on this, as Carrie said, this wonderful, beautiful spring Sunday. It's great, it's great to see the sun and have the sun shining um, and the warm temperatures. A couple of announcements um, just to call to your attention. Don't forget, um, uh, last week we handed out the Easter lily form. There's, if you don't have one, there's one, um, some of them outside the office door or we've emailed them. Uh, by next Sunday, we need, Carrie needs those in. Um, so uh, drop them off at the church office or um, uh, give it to Carrie after church this morning. Also, don't forget that uh, Chick Chat is next uh, Sunday after church. Um, ladies that are involved in that, uh, bring your lunch and um, stick around after church next Sunday. Also in your uh, announcement sheet is um, the little blurb there about uh, saving the date. And don't forget Easter extravaganza. We're having a drive through Easter extravaganza um, on April 3rd. Yes, April 3rd, um, and uh, we need lots of candy for that, so uh, uh, be bringing that in. And uh, there's a new ladies' Bible study that will be starting up in, in April as well. If you need more information or want to hear more information about that, uh, you can see Lynn Hannon on that. Um, and don't forget this morning to sign in um, on the registration uh, booklets there on either end of, of the pew, and um, our offering boxes are out in the lobby or, or by the church office door as well. Well, it's good to have you here this morning. Um, have you come with your cups right side up? Ready to hear, right? If you have your cup upside down, if you're in a restaurant and you don't drink coffee, you turn your cup upside down, what does that mean? I don't want coffee, right? You can't, you can't fill it very full if the cup's upside down. And uh, this morning, have you come with your cup right side up? ready and willing and wanting to hear. Again, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching, worshiping with us online this morning, is your cup right side up, ready to hear what God has to say to you today. Not what I say. I do hope you listen. But more importantly, what God has to say to you this morning. And so in that, let's, let's just bow for prayer here today. Father, it's good to be in your house. It's good to be in your presence. It's good to be with other believers. And Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would settle upon this place, would settle upon each home where people uh, are worshiping with us online. Again, as we have prayed in times past, I, I thank you so much that you are not uh, confined to a certain space or to a certain building. But, Lord, you are everywhere. And so as much as we ask that you would be here and show up in a powerful way here this morning, Lord, I pray that you would settle upon each living room, each kitchen, each place where people are, are worshiping this morning and, and tuning in. Lord, we don't want this just to be a gathering of people today. Lord, we want you to be in the center. Lord, that we would be open and willing to hear from you and what you have to say to us this morning. Yes, it's great to hear what other people have to say, but Lord, we need a fresh touch from you. We need to, to hear what you have to say to us this morning. So it's in spite of all the distractions and all the things on our to-do list and all the activities of today and the beautiful weather and, and all the things that we want to get accomplished outside, Lord, may we tune in to you. You say with the psalmist, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it. And so, Father, I pray that our worship this morning, all aspects of our worship would be pleasing to you. You are an awesome God. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you don't change. That you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and in that we stand. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do this morning. We love you. We praise you. As we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand as the worship team comes back and just continues to leave, lead us in worship. Come, let us. 
us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. part of that song is the hallelujah God above it all, hallelujah God unshakable. How many times in this last year have we been shaken? I I don't know about you, but my anxiety has been through the roof this year. (laughs) So I hang on to a God that is unshakable. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been Good 
you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been the grave 
Amen. You may be seated. Aren't you so glad? The kids are dismissed head downstairs to junior church. But aren't you so glad that Easter isn't just once a year? That Easter isn't even just once a week. But every day is Easter, right? Every day the tomb is empty. Every day. Christ is alive. And because of that, we can be and live in victory. Amen? Amen. That uh, Easter is not just. Yes, we celebrate it two weeks. Two weeks from today is Easter, yes. Um, And we'll celebrate it then. But every day is Easter for us as Christians, as believers. And really, every day is Easter for everybody, right? Regardless of, of what you believe or regardless of uh, what your religious beliefs are, It doesn't matter. The truth is Christ is alive and the tomb is empty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for the hope that that gives us in spite of the anxiety and the pressures and the craziness of this world and our life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that the tomb is empty. We thank you for what that means, that you are alive and the power and the hope that is ours. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for those times that, that we live as if you're still in the tomb, as if you're still hanging on the cross, thinking that we have to do it in our own strength, in our own power, that we have to make it happen somehow. Lord, I thank you that death could not hold you, that the stone could not keep you in the grave, that you are alive, and we can live in victory. We don't have to be victim. We don't have to have that victim mentality. But we come from a place of victory. And we fight Satan from a place of victory. We battle Satan from a place of victory. We, we deal with this world and the struggles and the turmoils and the difficulties of this world. We, we come from a place of being a victor. And so, Father, help us as believers, as your children, to remember our, our identity, to, to keep our heads lifted high knowing that you're on the throne, knowing that you have our back, knowing that you are alive and all that power that rose, that that helped you come from the the dead is ours as well and lives in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. So thank you, Father. Thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, as we open your word, open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us. Thank you for your presence here this morning. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, the the verse that's up on the screen, um, has kind of been our theme verse, our our verse that that we are um, launching from 
um, as, as we talk and, and um, deal with some things that, that seem like ashes, uh, but yet God can take what, what seems like ashes, what seems like difficult times, and turn them into oaks of righteousness, turn them into a display for God's splendor. Isaiah 61, verse 3, And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting for the Lord for the display of His splendor. Isn't it just like God to take ashes and turn them into oaks of righteousness, right? To take something that, that seems like hopeless, seems like destruction, seems like nothing good can come out of it and turn it into oaks of righteousness, turn it into something that can be a display for his splendor. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at temptation, right? I mean, temptations are, are difficult. We, we, we struggle with them. Sometimes we fall into them. Sometimes we um, are victorious over them. Uh, but God can take something like temptation and, and strengthen us through it um, and help us to thrive and help us to be victorious. And we talked about in Matthew chapter 4, right, of overcoming temptation. We have to remember our identity, right, that you are a son, you are a daughter of God, and he loves you, and he's well pleased with you, right? Right? God spoke those words over Jesus to Jesus before he had done anything, before his earthly ministry had ever started. To remember our identity and that Scripture is our, our weapon um, in our battle of temptation. And then last week we talked about humility. Again, it's something that is a struggle for us in John chapter 13, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Humility, it, it's, it's not easy for us. It doesn't come easy. We have to let go of our pride. We have to let go of our position and our power and our plan and submit to God. And last week we looked at what humility looks like in Philippians chapter 2. Right? It looks like listening. It looks like serving. It looks like giving. Well, this morning when I talk about Maybe a topic that I haven't ever preached on, at least that I can remember. And if Betty was here, she would be telling me I'm having a senior moment. And maybe I am. But, but I want to talk about contemplation. About contemplation. And, and what is it? What is contemplation? Well, basically, in, in all, very simply, is just being still and quiet with God. Just being still and quiet with God. And on the outset, it seems like, well, well that's kind of a waste of time, right? That's, that, that's kind of a, a useless thing. What's, what's the point of, of all of that? Well, contemplation, right, it's just that silence and solitude, just being in the presence of God, just listening to Him, just, just being in the presence of God, just focusing in on Him. Right? In, in the busyness of life, we often, and it's easy for us to neglect that, that connection to the source of our spiritual life and power. And because we do that, then we sometimes wonder why God seems so distant to us. Right? I mean, have you been there? Yeah. Church is a good place to be honest. Right? We, we've all been there right? at times feeling like God is, is distant, feeling like, like man, where, where is God? And it's, it's hard to just be still and quiet. Right? It feels awkward. You know how long that was? 15 seconds. Seemed like a long time, didn't it? I was going to do it for a minute, but I couldn't do it for a minute. Right? It seems awkward. It seems awkward. Right? It, yes, it, it's great to worship and be in church. It's great to worship corporately. It's great to worship online. It's, it, it's, it's beneficial to listen to Bible teaching 
and preaching on podcasts and the radio and TV. It's, it's beneficial to go to Bible studies. It's uplifting to listen to worship music during the week. It's, it's great to have prayer time in your car on the way to work and to offer those shooter prayers in the midst of a crazy, busy day. But there's a closeness with God, a spiritual strength and power that comes from being still and silent before God. Just a meditating and, and, and focusing on him. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And then God goes on to say, does anybody know the rest of that verse? But you would have none of it. But you would have none of it. None of it. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. Boy, that was written thousands of years ago, and how applicable is that to you and I and me in my life, right? Of, of We struggle to have that quietness of just meditating and focusing and contemplating on who God is and what he has done for us. And, and, and I'm coming this morning certainly not from having this down by any stretch of the imagination. Remember when your children were young, or maybe your grandchildren were young, and, and you might be reading a book and they might be playing, or you might be watching TV or, or cooking or, or doing something in the house, and, and they're in the same room or maybe the next room, but, but all of a sudden the, your, your young toddler would come running up to you and, 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 and just want to hug. If you're sitting in a chair, just run up and climb up and, 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 and hug you. Maybe not even say anything or ask anything. They just needed a hug from mommy and daddy. They just needed a hug from, from grandpa or grandma. That be, just being in the same house, just being in the same room wasn't good enough. Right? That they just wanted to hug. They just needed a hug. You remember those days? Even this morning, little Elijah, right? He's old enough to walk in, but he wanted mommy to carry him. Right? It wasn't enough just to be next to mommy. It wasn't enough just to hold mommy's hand. He wanted to be held by mommy. And that's what, that's what contemplation is about. That's what this silence and solitude is, is all about. It's, it's not just enough from time to time to know that God's presence is with us. It's not just enough to be doing all these things. But from time to time, we have to take time and just be silent and quiet and find that solitude and just crawl up in God's lap. It's not enough just to know his presence is with us on a daily basis. That's what contemplation, that's what silence and solitude is all about. So have you take your Bibles, and, or the ones there in your seats, and, and I want to look at a bunch of different scriptures this morning. And um, uh, first of all, looking how Jesus modeled this. I mean, if Jesus, the very Son of God, the one that was God, that spoke things into existence. If, if Jesus understood the importance of this in his earthly minister, ministry, how much more than you and I need this? In Matthew chapter 4, in Matthew chapter 4, Pastor Scripture, we looked at a couple of weeks ago. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now, when did, when did the temptation begin with Jesus? Was it during the 40 days? No. What does is, what is the next word of verse 2 say? After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So sometimes we... we, we think that, that the temptation took place during the 40 days of fasting. No, the temptation took after. So for 40 days, for 40 days, Jesus was silent. Jesus was just alone with God. He spent 40 days in solitude and, and contemplation and contemplative prayer, focusing on God and the task that was at hand 
before him. Understanding this ministry that he was about to undertake. He didn't just rush into his ministry after 10 minutes of prayer and devotions. Right? But, but 40 days, 40 days. Turn me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 24. In Matthew chapter 14, <clears throat> verses 22 through 24. <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So here we see Jesus dismissing the crowd, dismissing the disciples, and realizing that he needed solitude. He needed silence. He needed time alone in prayer with God. Just being able to listen and just being in the presence of God. Turn with me to, to Matt, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. Now, Jesus didn't do this every day, but he recognized there was times in the rhythm of life that he needed to set aside of silence, of solitude, of just being in God's presence. Mark chapter 1, begin with verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, so the disciples. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have came. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. And if you look at verses 29 through, through 34, you'll see what Jesus was doing just before this. He, he was healing people and driving out demons and ministering to people and all that. And, and again, we see Jesus going off to a solitary place to spend time alone with his heavenly Father. There was lots of demands on his life. There was lots of work still to do. And some people could have argued, well, but Jesus, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of people that need you. Why are you going off by yourself? But Jesus understood the importance of recharging his spiritual batteries. And then one last section of Scripture, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, <clears throat> verses 39 through 41. I'm sure you'll recognize this passage of Scripture, a very familiar passage of Scripture, especially this time of year, Lent, and, and heading towards Palm Sunday and Good Friday and, and Easter. In Luke chapter 22, Beginning with verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples and found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. There's times, yes, there's times that we need other people with us and to be praying for us. But Jesus shows us here that there's also time when we need to just get alone and cry out to God. As I was studying this passage of Scripture and, and studying some of these passages where, where Jesus went off by himself to spend time alone with God. It's very interesting in the New Testament, there's two places. There's two places that the Bible tells us that God sent angels to minister to Jesus when he was here on earth. We just read one of them here in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's about to face the cross and all of that. But the second one, do you remember where the second one was? Yeah, we read the beginning part of that a few minutes ago in Matthew chapter 4 when he was in being tempted. 
as Jesus was, was tempted and, and overcame the temptations. And then at the end of that passage in Matthew chapter 4, God sends angels and ministering to Jesus. Now, I, th- I just think it's very interesting. Sometimes we, obviously I'm not saying that uh, there's no benefit in praying with other people because we know that there is. But I think Scripture, the Holy Spirit, inspired uh, these different men to write about these events, reminding us that there is times that we just need to get away and be with God in silence and solitude and pouring out our heart to God and that God can minister to us in those moments. And so we see Jesus modeling it, right? And in our heads, we, we probably understand the benefit of it. But, but why do we struggle with this idea of silence and solitude before God? A couple of things. Two things we're going to talk about. And there's certainly lots of other excuses that we have. And one of them is busyness. Is, is busyness. We live busy. We live full. We live overscheduled lives. We seem to go from one moment when we get out of bed to the, and just fill our moments from the moment we get out of bed to the moment we lay back down again. And we face stimulus, again, from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed. For many of you, what's the last thing you check before you go to bed? Your phone. What's the first thing you check when you get up in the morning? Your phone. Or maybe the last thing you turn off before you go to bed is the radio or the TV. And what's the first thing you turn on in the morning when you get up? The radio or the TV. It's so easy. We, we, we are constantly bombarded by things. We, we, we dislike silence. We dislike solitude. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like we've become addicted to noise. And we're busy. So, so carving out time to just be silent with God, is, it's, it's hard. Right? It's just easier to do stuff for God than to just be with God. Right? So we keep busy doing things for God, and we, we skimp on being with God. We, we, we think that if, if I can just, you know, I'll read a, a passage of Scripture, pray, and then I go. Or we just, you know, it's so easy to just fall into that trap of being busy. And so, so busyness is an excuse. I think another reason that we find it hard to do is vulnerability. Vulnerability. We, we, we don't like to be vulnerable. We don't like to be honest with ourselves, and we don't like to be honest with God. And so if I can stay busy doing and maintain enough of a relationship with, with God by, by having devotionals once in a while and praying once in a while and attending church in person or online once in a while, listening to some Christian music, praying periodically, re- reading my Bible occasionally, then, then I can maintain some sort of a relationship with God. But consequently, it never goes very deep. But yet it's, it, it's satisfying enough, right? I, I kind of carry around in my spiritual wallet my get-out-of-jail-free card, get card, right? I kind of maintain a relationship with God. But it doesn't go very deep. But when we, when we become silent and get alone with God, then his spotlight begins to really shine in our life. And then we have to become a little bit more vulnerable. We don't like that vulnerability. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Page 74 in the Bible is there in your seats. Exodus chapter 20, a very telling passage of Scripture of of human nature. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. This is when when Moses has been out up on Mount Sinai and and, um, uh, gotten the Ten Commandments and, and, and all of that. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. 
They were fearful of the presence. They were fearful of the power of God. They wanted to keep God at arm's length. They wanted someone else to tell them what God was saying. They would rather have someone else speak to them about what God says than for God to speak directly to them. As I ran across this passage of Scripture this week and thinking about this, and you know what? How things don't change in a lot of respects, right? I mean, it's the same today for so many people, but it's just a different way that it's played out, right? right? Well, I'll, I'll look to the pastor, or I'll look to a priest, or, or I'll look to a Bible teacher, or I'll look to a musician, or I'll look to a Christian author to, to tell me what God says rather than spend time directly with God and going to the source. Right? Because really there's less accountability that way. Because if God speaks directly to you, and I'm not saying that God can't speak to you through these other methods, but there's something about when God speaks directly to you, that there's, there's accountability there. There's a vulnerability that takes place. And, and it's, it's much easier and much more comfortable to have someone else tell us what God says rather than go directly to the source. And so here we have Exodus chapter 20 where the people say to Moses, hey, you, you tell us what God has to say. We, we, we don't, you know, we're afraid of what God is, is going to say. We're, we're, we're afraid of the presence and, and the power of God. And now turn with me to Exodus chapter 33, a number of chapters later. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. We see how this, how this plays out. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. God spoke to Moses face to face as, as someone would speak to a friend. And earlier in that passage, and earlier in, in, in Exodus chapter 33, it says that, that while Moses was speaking to God, while God was speaking to Moses in a very real, a very personal, a very intimate way, the people were in the doorway of their tent worshiping God. That's great. That's good, but yet it doesn't say that people had that intimate, personal relationship with God. They worship God from a distance. They worship God in, in, in the doorway of their tent versus face-to-face -face like Moses. He was called a friend of God. Busyness, vulnerability. Well, what are some of the benefits when, when we allow busyness, when we allow vulnerability to, to keep us away from that time of silence, of solitude, of, of contemplative time with, with God, of just focusing in, just crawling up in God's lap and letting him give us a hug and spending time with him? What are the benefits of that? Well, one is that we minimize the distractions during prayer. Right? Let's, let's be honest again. Our prayer times can be filled with distractions, right? It can be filled with distractions. The phone rings. We get a text. We get some notification on our phone. The doorbell rings. Kids cry. Our spouse needs something. A song we love on the radio comes along. And, and, and we have all of these distractions, right? And those are all the external distractions, not the internal distractions. I haven't even talked about those. But those are just the external distractions, and then, and then there's those internal distractions, right? We begin praying about something, and then, oh, that's right, i got to add this to my to-do list, or, or, oh, that's right, I need to pick this up at the grocery store, or, or, or you, you know, squirrel, or whatever, right? Or we, we, we have all those internal distractions as well. Now, obviously, we can't always get away from the distractions, but it is important to periodically get alone with God in silence and, and eliminate those external distractions. I mean, if your prayer time with God is, is only when you drive to and from work, you're not going to develop a very deep relationship with God. If the only time you pray, the only time you look at your Bible, the only time you open your Bible is in church or in, or is in a Bible study, again, you're not going to develop a very deep relationship with God. And so there's times we need to just get away to minimize the distractions in our prayer time, in our time alone with God. Second of all, another benefit to this is, is just being able to be physically and spiritually restored. 
we all have the need from time to time to rest- be restored both physically and spiritually. It's why we have a, a weekend. It's why we have a, a day off from work. It's, it's why we take vacations to be restored physically. In these times of contemplations, these times of getting away, of minimizing the dis- distractions, we, we can be renewed and, and, and restored spiritually. Psalms chapter 23, the, the psalm that, that most Lots of people know. He leads me beside beside what? Still or quiet waters. He restores my soul. Do you ever allow God to lead you beside quiet or still waters? So that your soul can be restored and renewed? Jesus did this. And we read just some of those passages of Scripture where where he allowed God to lead him beside quiet, beside still waters, and his soul was renewed and restored and refreshed. And Jesus tried to teach his disciples the importance of that. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31 through 32, Jesus said to them, meaning his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Jesus knew that his disciples needed that solitude with God to recharge their physical batteries as well as their spiritual batteries. Another benefit of of doing this and and building this into the rhythm of our life is is that it helps us to gain a spiritual perspective. It helps us to, to, to kind of get back to center a little bit in our spiritual lives. We are constantly bombarded with information. We're constantly bombarded with news. We're constantly bombarded with, with opinions. And, and, and we constantly allow ourselves, for good or for bad, you can determine that for yourself, uh, being bombarded and fed information from, from new sources that, that we believe are, are reliable and, and, and truthful. And then that forms our opinions on events and people and all those things. But man, there's times where we need to just shut off all of those external information sources and regain and get God's spiritual perspective on things. Right? Not what Fox News' perspective is, not what MSNBC's perspective is, not what Newsmax's perspective is, or your neighbors, or Facebook's, or, or any of those things. And just to crawl up in our heavenly daddy's lap and to gain a spiritual perspective on the things that are happening in our world and things that are happening in in, in our life. To gain and regain God's perspective on things. Then another benefit of all this is is to seek the will of God. To seek God's will. We see a lot of times Jesus doing this right before some major events in his life. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God by himself because the next morning when he got up and he went back with people, he chose the 12 apostles out of all of his disciples. And I'm not saying that it's not important, as I said earlier, I'm not saying that it's not important to ask other people to pray for us in discerning God's will. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask mature believers uh, their opinion and their thoughts and their perspective on things. And yes, there are times that God reveals His will and His plan for us in public, meaning with with the help of other people and, and, and asking other people to pray for us. But I also believe that there are times that he discloses his will for your life in those private moments, in that wrestling with God by ourselves in private, just you and God. When we get away and we get alone with God in silence and solitude. And then the last benefit of, that we're going to mention here this, this morning is, is that it's showing faith in God. Of, of building our faith in God. Because basically, right, we, 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 we say that we're too busy to do this. And in essence, what we're really saying, because, because no matter how busy we are, no matter how busy I am, no matter how busy you are, 
you find time to do what you want to do, right? You, you find the time to do what you want to do, what you feel is important to you. You, you find that time. And basically, when we're saying, I'm too busy to spend time with God, we're really saying, I don't really need God, right? That I can handle this stuff on my own. That I can handle what's on my plate in my own skill, in my own strength, in my own smarts. But taking time to, to be with God, those, those, those moments of, of our devotional time when, when we, you know, yes, are distracted from time to time. But even when we take those moments and we get away from all the busyness and the distractions and just spend time with God, we're, we're showing faith in God. We're, we're saying to God, listen, I understand that, that this has to be important in my life. Yes, my to-do list is nine pages long. There's things that are clamoring for, clamoring for my attention. Kids and spouse and work and neighborhoods and, and all of those things. We saw that with Jesus. Hey, where, where did you go, Jesus? There's lots of people that need you. You, you know, you're doing great things. People need you. Why would you go off by yourself? But it's showing faith in God that God is going to redeem those times that we have left, the time that we have left in our schedule, and that in his strength and in his power, he'll help us to accomplish what needs to be accomplished in that moment and in that time. We think it's a waste. We think it's too hard to do. But there's so much spiritual benefit that can come out of it. But what I don't want us to do is, as I wrap this up is to get overwhelmed when, uh, of the thought of this. Right? That, that no, well, how in the world? I've got kids. I've got work. I've got grandkids. I've, I've, you know, it's a crazy time that we're living in. How can I ever find time to do this? You know what? We just have to start small. And it's something that we need to begin, if you haven't already had that habit, of, of building into the rhythm of your life. Sure, it's more difficult if you work, if you have kids at home, and, but we make time for what we want to do. Right? To, smart, to start small, right? To just find a few minutes here or there where we can just sit silently focusing on God, focusing on a verse of Scripture. Finding a quiet place in the house, if, and if you can't find a quiet place in the house to, to go outside or go to a park or, or take a walk in the woods or, 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 or something. It's not about preparing for a sermon. It's not about preparing for a Bible study. It's not about preparing, bringing to God a long list of prayer requests. It's just about being with God, focusing on God, delighting being in His presence. And this year, I was, I was really struggling on what to do with, with Monday, Thursday, and do we have it, do we not have it, and all of that. But as, as I was preparing this sermon this week and praying about our Monday, Thursday service, and, and what do we do, God just seemed to keep saying to me, you know what, this is what I want you to do. And so we're going to have a Monday, Thursday service on April 1st at 6.30. And this is kind of what, what we're going to do, we just kind of no music, no big, long sermon, and don't everybody say amen. Just a, a couple of passages of Scripture, just a time to come and sit. Yeah, we'll have communion. We'll share communion together. But just to have some quiet time to come, to sit. I'll share a few passages of Scripture. We'll have some time in prayer. But just to take some moments to crawl up in God's lap and just to be in His presence. Say, you know what, it's not enough that I'm in the same room. It's not enough that, that I know God is with me, but just to be with God. I want to look at one more passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. A familiar verse of Scripture, right, to, to most of us. Here I am, Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. A lot of times we look at that passage of Scripture and we say that this passage of Scripture in the, in the book of Revelations, is dealing with unsaved people, right? That, that God is knocking at the heart of unsaved people. And if, if they would just open the door, then, then God would, would come in and into their life and, and forgive them their sins and have a relationship with him. And, and yes, that this verse is applicable to that context. 
but a new thought came to me this week as, as I was preparing the, for this sermon. Who were these words spoken to? These words were spoken to a church. These words were spoken to believers. These words were spoken to Christians. This was what, what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. And in, in the previous to these verses, Jesus is, is coming down hard on them because they're lukewarm. And Jesus is saying to them, hey, I want to spend time with you. I want you to just be with me. They weren't spending time with Jesus, busyness, vulnerability, or, or whatever their excuse was, right? They weren't spending time with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. They were letting someone else say what God was speaking. They weren't spending that time with God. Jesus is wanting to. He's inviting them. He's longing to be with them, but they're not hearing or responding to that invitation, to that knock of Jesus. And Jesus is doing the same thing to you and I, right? That he's longing for you to just climb up in his lap and snuggle with him. Father, forgive us for using all kinds of excuses, busyness, the coronavirus, season of life, whatever it is, of not taking time just to be with you. Oh, yes, from time to time we have our devotions and we, we bring our, our list of prayer requests. We, we, we read a passage of Scripture from the Daily Bread or, or whatever we felt led to, to read in that day. And that's great. We need those things. We need church. We, we need Christian music. We need Christian books. We need Bible studies. All those things are important. But, Father, may that not be enough for us. Lord, help us to build into the rhythm of our life those times where we can just get away and crawl up into your lap and just be with you. Lord, we need it. We need it spiritually. We need it physically. Lord, and you long, you long for those moments where we just crawl up in your lap and you hug us. We just spend a few moments in your presence, focusing on you, focusing on who we are in you. And so, Lord, help us not to buy into the lies of Satan, but help us to realize and understand we sing this song that we're going to sing in just a few moments, that, that your presence is heaven to us. But, Lord, may it not just be words on the screen, may it not just be words that the worship team sings, may it not just be words we sing. But Lord, may it be a desire, may it be the reality of our lives that we want. We understand that those moments with you are truly heaven. In your name I pray, amen. Let's stand as the worship team comes and leads us in this song.
Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for your presence here this morning. We have felt that you are here. Lord, I pray that you would help us um, in this whole thing of silence and solitude, just being in your presence, crawling up on your lap, just allowing you to love on us and to hear from you. Lord, be with us this week. Lord, we thank you for your strength and your power. Lord, may we walk in victory this week. In your name I pray. If you just have a seat, uh, Mike's going to come and, and um, there he is, um, and uh, lead you in the, in the vote and has a couple of announcements. The leadership of the Community Wesleyan Church in Baldwinsville, New York. But first, we'll take a 10 minute break. If you need to leave or you need to use the restroom or stretch, uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> 